Welcome to the British Chamber of Commerce Singapore's podcast channel. We're excited to bring you season three of new episodes featuring in-depth content across Singapore, ASEAN and the United Kingdom. We've had some extraordinary guests on our channel, including Formula One's Claire Williams. I'm a firm believer that any great team, any successful team has a great culture flowing through it. You aren't successful if you don't. So we put a lot of work into this. Renowned mountaineer Kenton Cool. That 2019 there with a client, a big storm came in and literally destroyed Camp 2. And I've got some video footage of Sherpas like trying to hold on to the tent fabric as it blows away. And the Royal Navy's Commodore Steve Morehouse, commander of the UK Carrier Strike Group. The squadron of F-35 aircraft we have on board is a Royal Air Force squadron. And, and the personnel on there are drawn from both the Navy and the Air Force. So it's a what better way of, of showing just the efficiency and the joined up nature that we now have. And distinguished Sky News anchor, Jeremy Thompson. We had two little vans with satellite links and we, le- we leapfrogged up the road to Pristina, the capital, uh, throughout that first day with non-stop coverage from basically inside a war zone. We also sit down with the likes of TikTok, Twitch and Twitter and continue to bring you conversations around business and trade, leadership and people, sustainability, sports and arts and much, much more. Thank you, as always, for your support and we hope you enjoy this podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of In Conversation with me, David Kelly. We have kick-started 2022 and our third series of our podcast channel with some fantastic guests covering topics such as NFTs, diversity, inclusion and social media. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Tim Marlowe, Chief Executive and Director at the Design Museum London and the world's leading museum devoted to contemporary design. Tim was previously the Artistic Director of the Royal Academy of Arts and Director of Exhibitions at White Cube, and he's been involved in contemporary art for the past 30 years as a curator, writer and a broadcaster as well. He's worked with many of the most important and influential artists of our time to deliver a wide-ranging and popular array of programmes and brings a commitment to diverse and engaging exhibitions to his new role showcasing the transformational capability of design. Tim, it is amazing to have you with us today. Thank you for being our first In Conversation guest of 2022. It really is uh, it's great to have you with us. I'm delighted. Great. The first of 2022. Here's to a much better year in 22 than most of us had in 21. Oh, let's, let's absolutely hope so. And hope we can come on to some of that as well and sort of through the conversation around sort of how, how COVID has had an impact on the museum. But I guess just to get things going, can we just sort of warm up and just find out a little bit about sort of um, how you ventured into the art world. How did, how did, how did your sort of uh, journey to, um, to where you are today start? It's an interesting question. I, I'm not a, I'm not a um, frustrated practitioner. I never really had any talent in the, in the pursuit of art or in the, in the practice of art. I was an historian. I was always interested in history when I was younger. And then I got into art history academically through, through that. But actually my, my dad was a vicar and um, we, we had various parishes, but there was a rural parish in Northamptonshire when I was about five or six. And my cousin came to stay and found this dead bat in the porch. My cousins were from uh, Glasgow and he, my cousin took this bat in a box back to his local museum, which happened to be the Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow, which is an encyclopedic museum. I am going purposefully with this story, by the way, it's meandering, but he took it to the bat curator who said to identify it. And they said, no, this is actually quite rare. Would you like to donate it? So my cousin did. And um, every summer we'd go up and stay with the family up in Glasgow. And my brother and I were very proud. We always wanted to go and see Stuart as our cousin, Stuart's bat. And in the museum to go and see the bats, You meander through this amazing range of collections. And the first painting I took notice of was Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross. And actually that 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 fascinated me uh, for all sorts of reasons. So actually, my, and, and that I, I always realised subsequently that was the seeds of my interest in art. There was this great Rembrandt head of a painting of a head of a soldier in the same collection that I then moved on to. But that was my route in, and then subsequently went you know as an historian, I got more interested in art history, and um, on on I went from there. What an amazing sort of intro as to sort of your career. That's incredible. And so. At the Design Museum, I think it is one of the most iconic museums in London, isn't it? Um, I mean, it exhibits product, industrial, graphic, fashion and architectural design. I think you also won in 2018 the Museum, uh, European Museum of the Year Award. So an amazing, amazing place. It must be incredible to work there. How have the, sort of the last couple of years been for you as the Chief Executive and Director? <laughs> A baptism of fire. I mean, I joined in January 2020. 
And within three months, I had to lock the museum down, which is probably the worst start from any museum director in the history of museums in London. Um, it, so it's been tough, but actually the museum has, is, is, it's agile and it's got a very committed team. And we were the, amongst the first to open, reopen and we opened fully. Uh, I mean, as in, you know, our, we had an exhibition of actually designed an electronic music ready to go. And I think we've, we've, we've done well, I think, uh, in terms of, you know, the public perception. Obviously, you know, we have to be incredibly safe, but design ought to be able to find a way through as to how you can mediate some of these problems. I think, without being too gloomy, I think it's going to be a really tough few years ahead, though, for museums, because there is a, a, a the route back to whatever normality is. But I think visitor numbers to London certainly are going to take a long time to recover. And like all museums, we're dependent on footfall. You know, that's our that's how we thrive, survive and thrive. And we, we're not um, in receipt of major uh, state funding. We get a very small amount each year. I and mean, I'd like to change that um, because as the only design museum, as the National Design Museum, I think we're worth supporting. But we have this amazing building that used to be the Commonwealth Institute at the foot of um, Holland Park that's been beautifully converted by John Prawson, who is a, the most distilled minimalist. It's such beautiful uh, um, uh, transformation, but it just makes me want to ruffle it up. So my, my aim is to ruffle up and use the building, animate it, uh, give it a sense of a whole range of different activities and actually fill it with different kinds of activities. That's, that's the challenge, but uh, the, the signs are good at the moment. Oh, that sounds really interesting. And, and like you said, we don't want to dwell on it, but it has been a really interesting couple of years, right? I mean, looking at funding models, looking at engagement, you know, obviously, if you've been so reliant on football and tourism for that, how, how have you sort of as a business leader, how, how have you managed that over the last couple of years? How have you sort of made sure that everything sort of worked financially, sustainably? Um, and how have you kept sort of people motivated? Because you must have had to see so much change over the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, well, the first thing is, um, and, I, you know, I need to give credit for this. Um, the, the Cultural Recovery Fund, the state were really quick to respond. And we advocated, I think, obviously well. And we were, we, the government support, supported us. I mean, they helped us. I mean, as you would imagine, um, the case that was made was through no fault of ours, like many other institutions, we were forced to close. So we, I, I think having that endorsement actually has given quite a lot of um, uh, impetus to trying to find different models of funding going forward. But I think we have to be entrepreneurial. I mean, for for example, we did a project. We did a project with a, a major global drink sponsor. But you can cut out your podcast or not. Bombay Sapphire. They were brilliant because they came to the design museum and said, "We've got this idea about um, before the museums can reopen." This was in April uh, 2021. There was a whole debate about what was essential retail uh, in, in Britain, and they said, "Actually, we've got this idea about getting uh, designers." Uh, young designers to do the packaging on supermarket objects and then we want to turn a museum into a supermarket for a brief period of time are you interested and I said yeah we are uh, and I said but what we need to do is actually craft it um, and make it an installation not do it in the gallery but do it in our shop on the high street turn that into an installation which is what we did so 10 emerging designers um, did the packaging for everything from loo roll to pasta to coffee that we sold at supermarket prices that was a there were a thousand of each object we were open for five days the whole shop was then turned from shop into installation back into shop by Camille Wallala who's a designer and we sold out in three and a half days and Bombay Sapphire not only gave us a fee but they gave us all the proceeds for our emerging designers fund and and that's the kind of initiative that we were both receptive to uh, we were able to kind of you know help mold shape and it, it, the model for the future isn't to do the same thing again and again, but it's to be open to and to look at how you can work in different ways with different potential supporters. It was a, it was a really enjoyable project, actually. And I love the fact that, you know, lockdown in, 20, in March, April 2020 began with people stockpiling lavatory rolls. And then we came we came out of the second lockdown in Britain selling lavatory rolls quite profitably, actually. Oh, that's a, that's a, I, I love that. Love that creativity is absolutely fabulous. And you talked about the agility of the museum as well. I mean, and you, you've just described some something that's so you know tangible, and you can see it, and you can you can touch it, and you can buy it, which is all part of the experience, right? I mean, how much of the digital process have you sort of had to go through over the last couple of years? Have you tried to connect with your customers you know, in a slightly different way? Yes, um, um, we were quick 
to go digital. I mean, we have digital channels. I mean, I think we're still the fourth most followed um, museum in the world on Instagram. So there's quite there's, there's a lot to build on and work with. But we 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 went digital immediately. I did a weekly interview with uh, designers, architects. But actually, more importantly, more impressively, uh, we were we went on to digital class. Uh, we had, you know we had digital learning sessions, family sessions, group sessions, work with designers practically as well as in conversational terms and that did really really well and there's no doubt that the public programming of, of a museum like ours and many museums have to be digitally engaged it's how you it can engage with with digital audiences and actually we managed quite successfully to do an event which sold thousands of tickets for a tour of our electronic exhibition not as with the model being that a number of museums have looked at oh charge people to see the exhibitions digitally I think it needs to be more nuanced than that. So we had a kind of panel discussion and we had various practitioners from that world who took part in the special evening and it, you know, it, it became event television. So people who'd seen the exhibition wanted to, to, to pay the ticket to, to take part in the event and those who hadn't had the opportunity to see it globally or nationally also felt that they wanted to take part, which I think is important. But I would also add that we have to be careful about getting too carried away with the digital. I mean, the digital is part of the toolkit of a museum. It's part of how we engage with our audiences. But I still, and it's also part of the design and creative landscape that we should explore creatively. Absolutely. But it's act also a way of driving people to the museum. And museums are physical spaces where people enjoy shared physical experiences, as well as emotional and cultural experiences. And um, the digital plays a role in that when you come to the museum, and it plays a role in driving traffic. But the notion that museums... Are going to be replaced by the digital in the future is something I, uh, I mean, I repudiate. One of the things that the pandemic has shown us is how much we want to come together and share share experiences. Um, so it, it, it's an interesting understanding and, and realignment of, of the role of digital. I think. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I was I was very lucky. It's a bit of a segue. I was very lucky to sort of go up to a uh, Seoul to the Samsung Gallery, and I think the way that they've also sort of used technology to. It's all hot spotted, and um, so it knows the, the, the kit knows exactly where you are. Then it helps to describe things in, in sort of small size, medium size, and long size chunks, depending on sort of how interested in the art you are. And I think that was thought oh, that was a really, really great experience going around the gallery. It's really good. So, can you give us a flavour of some of the things um, that are that are that are going to be coming up? What might someone expect to, to see if they visited the uh, the museum? Well, at the moment, we, we, we've got the last few weeks of a really important, um, I would say, landmark exhibition called Waste Age which looks at the issue of waste material with the, with the notion that within the next 50 years, waste material will become the single most, single largest, most prominent and most important resource on the planet. And it's looking at, well, partly looking at the responsibilities of design in that area, because design, design and design is a part of the problem of fueling mass consumption and, throw, and throwaway culture. But actually looking at what design and designers can do in collaboration with material scientists. I'm making it sound very dry. It's a phenomenally exciting show. Everything from fashion to architecture to new forms of materials to product design to longevity in design, you know, a toaster that will survive for 50 years. The, the processes of dye using enzymes where the, number, the amount of water used to dye the material is tiny rather than the thousands and thousands of litres that's required to make, you know, a few metres of cloth. So there's a whole range of, of, um, of, of solutions and possibilities going forward uh, with different kinds of materials in that exhibition. And uh, it, we have two, we always have, we have two exhibitions running in parallel, two suites of galleries. And then in our downstairs galleries, we've got an Amy Winehouse exhibition, an exploration of, of Amy seen through the lens of design. It's the 10th anniversary of her death. We've worked closely with her family. Um, it's been a very moving and, and quite an inspiring experience, actually. I mean, there's a lot of the clothes that she wore, there's the looks that she adopted, there's the impact that she had on street style, on, on music. But it's also a celebration and an exploration of that life through the lens of design. And I love the balance of, you, of those two exhibitions, you know, that one is, is, is hardcore design analysis looking to the future, and the other is using design to explore something familiar uh, in a new way. And actually, that's... One of the things I'm learning about design, you know, having come from the visual arts, is that it permeates so many different parts of, of, of you know, of our lives. But it gives us such an interesting way of looking at things. So the next big exhibition at the museum is um, design and football, and it's I have to say, um, it sounds like I'm blowing blowing my own trumpet, but I think it's a brilliant idea because no one's ever done that. There's been plenty of exhibitions looking at 
art and football but not design and football so everything from you know the stadium and the places we see the game to the kit to the technology to the graphic design around it but also to the mediation of the game to the formations that are adopted um to the culture around football you know tournaments um online gaming and so on anyway that's our next big exhibition which um hopefully will break through the tribalism of football um, your man united uh, I'm Chelsea. Chelsea are our local club, so obviously they're going to get favoured position um, because they're culturally more interesting. But anyway, um, he said making it tribal immediately. But um, the thing about football, um, you, I don't know if you've ever been to the Man United Museum, but the, there is a quite a good museum and the Chelsea have got a not bad museum, which currently shows the, you know, the, the Champions League trophy. But football museums tend to be interest the fans of particular clubs. Uh, interesting, what we're doing is taking a global view that will have a, a hopefully interest of football fans, but also to um, design aficionados, look at the overlap of all of that. Won't ignore the comment. I think we might have a few more trophies in our museum than you might have, but let's, uh, let's move. Let's move. <laughs> let's move. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, one of, one of the things that I, I you know, the, the design museum supports is, is research and development. And you talked about that, uh, the waste gauge piece and that there are so many things that we're going to have to face in it you know in the post-pandemic world around aging populations certainly that's something that singapore's looking at the moment around climate change and with cop 26 in, in the uk at the end of last year and the, the rise of ai can you just tell all our listeners a little bit more about your future observatory because it's an amazing program isn't it no it is and actually the way stage is the launch uh, is the launch pad for that right so again everything's down to uh trying to secure funding for the next five years and we have the first year in place but we've launched this idea called future observatory where the museum becomes a hub for the really impressive and wide-ranging amount of design research that's going on in different faculties and design faculties across the country so we are the hub of a national network of 15 major design research centres and we also have four design researchers in residence in the museum now uh, our director for the year Justin McGurk and his team are already looking at different ways of both mediating and showcasing the research that's taking place so we partly facilitate but we're really the place where I mean we want to be the interface between design design research and the public policy makers politicians but also business you know, the first thing that happens during a, an economic retraction is that research and design in companies goes out the window. And we want actually, you know, in, in, in practical ways to try and link link business up with d design and design research. We're looking at four or five themes over the next five years, and we're, we're still working out whether or not, I, th I think they'll they'll continue, they'll, over, they'll continue to overlap. But obviously the first is waste age and net zero. We already have a partnership with the Royal College of Art and the Helen Hamlin Institute there, the Design Age Institute. And, and you've already mentioned, but the notion of designing for an increasingly ageing population is, is really important. You know, not something that is literally or metaphorically just added on like a sort of badly designed handle that gets sort of put into a shower, but thinking about the way that public spaces, domestic spaces, the way we design is actually thinking about the needs of, of everyone and, and good design ought to be able to um, in, incorporate that. So that's really important. Mobility, the future of mobility and placemaking, you know, what will our cities look like? What is the best way of designing, redesigning, evolving cities? What about the idea of, of you know, getting people moving around cities in, in more sustainable ways? And then obviously there's always a sustainable angle. So um, net zero underpins so much of that. So that's the that's the idea that you know, and that we you know we have a, a we have a, a core group of people here, but who will be working on programming and um, there'll be symposia, digital programming. There will be physical activities here and displays, and we want to tour some of the displays and some of the research that we're showcasing. I'm going to ask the really silly question, which is, how do you pull all that together? So if you take a topic like the waste age or the aging population or mobility and placemaking. How, how do you pull all of those different stakeholders together with the different ideas? With how, how does all that work? I think it has to be design led or design research led. So you see the areas that are, that are being worked on and you see some of the ideas that are being presented or solutions that are, that are being devised, and you showcase them. I mean, you know, you, you have displays or you will take a big issue around it might be something as big as public attitudes to an aging population or the issue around um, something as specific as uh, the need to have uh, an eye drop dispenser for people with Parkinson's. And you make that the focal point of a, a discussion or a, 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 an online programme. So I think the important thing is, I mean, we haven't 
we haven't fully worked out when we're going to be microscopic and when we're going to be meta, as it were. But I think it, it, I think over the year, we, in order to engage as many people as possible, we need to be looking at what is being produced and then thinking about ways of showcasing it. And, and what I want to do is it's all about momentum. So it's getting on the radar, I mean, of various people who suddenly start to realise that this building that I'm sitting in at the moment is a physical as well as an intellectual hub for design and design exploration and design research. And, 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 that's, and, and that's key. That, and that's why it's so important that we've got you know, a decent period of time to do this. I mean, I want to establish it permanently. Incidentally, we've also set up an entrepreneur's hub in the museum, which is also something I'm really excited about and proud of where I mean, we've done it we've done it already and we're going to do it again uh, later this year but we, we and we've targeted people who otherwise wouldn't get access to the kind of mentoring that we, we we've offered but design can only take place with commission or opportunity very little design like say the visual arts take place takes place quietly in people's bedrooms or imaginations and they they, they they spend years producing designs and then they're later discovered whereas actually so most design is actually the the result the result of the opportunity to put it into practice and you need to bring people but it also requires entrepreneurship it requires funding so we've actually we had 15 incredibly wide-ranging and, and talented young entrepreneurs with ideas everything from a Muslim advent calendar to um, bespoke swimwear for people of different body shapes to different ideas of, of fashion and different materials used for fashion. And so they, they were mentored by a whole range of people for 15, it's, it was an intensive eight week course, people from business designers, artists, curators, um, uh, venture capitalists, they all came in and did sessions with them. And then we had a big pitching session just before Christmas. And those are, some of those ideas are already now going into serious commercial production. And that also is, is interesting to me because the museum world talks about entrepreneurialism, but in some ways it's, it's, it's kind of either it's its guilty seeker or it's something it doesn't really know how to deal with. But I have to embrace it with design because it can't happen without design. I mean, I, I know I worked in the commercial art world and then I worked in museums and institutions and I know there's a close relationship, but it's a, it's a fraught relationship. And there's a kind of, there's a worry that it mustn't be too close. Whereas in design, we need to embrace the idea of funding and, and seed capital and entrepreneurialism because without it, design doesn't function. And also good business and good ideas need good design to be able to to um you know to, to feed the, the, the businesses so there's a symbiotic relationship that we're exploring i think and facilitating i hope oh that, that's, that's really really interesting and just sort of st sticking on that theme as well around um around education as well i know that's it's an important pillar of ours in terms of the future skill sets that, that you know coming into the into the workspace with but I can also see it's reflected in your activities, and I understand the Design Museum, in collaboration with the Kingston School of Arts, um, offers a, a master's course as well. Can you just share a little bit about how you support the next generation coming through? Yeah, I mean, the master's is an, is an MA in design cu curation. The Entrepreneurs Hub is for people who are already in... Um, I mean, I've got ideas and, and it's not age specific, but it's, it's not people who are still at school. We do, a, um, we, do, we do this amazing initiative called Design Ventura, where school children aged 14, 15, 16, and, and we engineer it. So there's the, the main prize is for state schools and then there's a separate um, prize for uh, private and overseas schools because the resources are often much stronger there. And they, they have to come up with, it, 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 it has to be collaborative, there's a group of up to, up to five students have to come up with an idea that can be produced and sold in our shop for under £10. And again, we do group sessions with um, product design, but also entrepreneurs and how you get, you know, practically how you get these things done. And we, we've had we're, uh, over 90,000 active state school children engage with this over the last 10 years. And the, it's really brilliant what, um, what's produced. So that's school level. And then we've got postgraduate researchers, our design researchers in residence, so for us, the learning programme has to be across the board. I mean, obviously, we do, we do families. It's literally, well, literally cradle to grave. It's close to being literally cradle to grave. And one of the things I'm really both disturbed by, but very, very keen to try and help change, is the fact that design is being constantly reduced in importance on the curriculum 
and that the design and architectural landscape professionally is so monocultural. And we're missing a massive opportunity if we don't make it more diversified and and inclusive, because there are whole swathes of the community who just don't feel designs for them. And it really, I mean, the talent pool uh, needs to be as broad as possible. And uh, many, many people have much to contribute to the fields of design, but design, you know, without sounding too grandstanding, the future of our relationship to our planet and the future of humanity depends quite strongly on, you know, good design. Couldn't agree more. Can we just talk a little bit about your touring of exhibitions programme? Um, Because you've toured, I think, was it 130 exhibitions in 31 countries around the world? Yeah. Really keen to hear sort of how they've landed in other countries, what your learning experience has been on, on that as well, and, and, and how that sort of brought some of those um, other experiences back to support the museum in London. Really, really keen to hear a bit more about that. Well, tragically, since my tenure began, the, <laughs> the touring programme has been slightly curtailed, um, but there's many exhibitions ready to go well, I say many I mean we, we you know we, we, we'll be touring five or six any one moment I think but I think it's critical that design is universally resonant and we're one of the, the the institutions that wants to tour our program but also look at what other people are devising and you know if we can feel that there are serious audiences for it in London we you know it should be reciprocal but we I, I think that actually making your exhibitions that something that can be can taught is 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 sustainable and and we you learn a huge amount about the, the subject of the exhibition when you see it in a different context i mean we have an exhibition called material tales about different kinds of materials that's just opened in a second venue in china the football exhibition obviously there's massive interest in touring that waste age will also will also tour um moving to mars an exhibition at the end of 2019 closed at the beginning of 2020 that is um is, is touring and uh, as I say I mean I think it's m- museums we talk about collaboration uh, but it's very important that you know actually we share the research we do the products or the exhibitions or the displays that we make it's critical really that we we disseminate this and also we've talked a little about how the digital will work in that but there is no substitute for actually seeing the exhibition so it, it's it's very important it's something I want to build on even more I mean I do think we um we have to look at the volume as in museums of borrowing objects and shipping things around the world. We have to look at you know, a sustainable uh, model for that. But actually sharing research and moving carefully curated or selected exhibition projects around the world ought to be sustainably possible. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it, one needs to be careful about uh, the volume of, of how much you, of that you're doing, but it, I think it's really important. And so, yeah, we're very interested. And also, we, we're very interested in and engaging uh, with Singapore in, in this respect. We, we hope there's interest in some of our exhibitions. Football, you should be lobbying for that, of course. <laughs> we can try and help with some of that, definitely. And I'm just picking up that international piece. We're really looking forward to welcoming you in Singapore later this year during Singapore Design Week. And um, our members will also get the opportunity to meet you at our Leaders and Business Lunch. So thank you in advance for that. We're really looking forward to uh, seeing you. But just turning to Singapore, what are your plans when you come over here? And, and sort of what, what's the relationship with between the, uh, the museum and Singapore? Well... I'm very, I mean, Singapore is a, is, a, is a fantastically interesting place, isn't it? It's a kind of, I mean, it's a hub in, in many ways. I mean, I'm, I'm keen to find out a lot more, actually. I mean, I have to, let, let me tread carefully, but I was quite strongly involved in the setting up of a commercial gallery in Hong Kong when White Cube opened there a few years ago. I then got quite involved in programming for uh, around both, not both the art fair, but also I curated some exhibitions in Hong Kong and, and there were plans to do more. Hong Kong is changing uh, quite dramatically. Um, I'm not going to wade into the geopolitics of the, of the Pacific region and, and of Asia and of Southeast Asia, but it does look to me as if Singapore, with its own identity strongly established, also has opportunities that will be afforded as the status and the cultural possibilities for Hong Kong change. So that interests me a lot, actually. Uh, and, um, and I think that um, Singapore, the, the conversations I've had so far, See, it seems very clear that Singapore is is very curious to, open to, interested in design. And there's a strong culture around design in Singapore. So it seems there's a there's a big opportunity to to um to explore a reciprocal relationship there. Oh super. No, we're really really looking forward to having you over here. And for anyone that's worked and lived in London, they'll know art in the underground as well. And I 
I used to tell me advisory board, I believe. So do you have any prominent memories of featured artists or stories of that particular set? So, so. <laughs> tell you what, I, I, do, I do. It's I'm amazed in a, in a world where everything has to be scrutinised. The, the London Underground, it, it, in some ways, it, it's a national disgrace how poorly it's funded and the, and the, the political football that is kicked around because, you know, it's a, it's a national network, even though it serves London. It's used by everyone who visits the city. But I am really heartened by the fact that there is a kind of ring fence, very small budget that doesn't seem to get challenged. It's not seen as a waste of money and it isn't that expensive, the amount of money that's put into it. And also in a culture where understandable concerns around health and safety, nonetheless, interesting art can take place. So actually, I love the fact that things can just be temporarily cited in, in a museum as you go up the escalators, text pieces, or uh, uh, I mean, it's not objects that are going to sort of get in the way. And there are new stations now being built uh, but, uh, and there's a, there's a new line, actually, that's being built in, in London. And the idea of having commissioned artworks in each station is really interesting. So I, I don't want to give the game away, but there's some quite interesting, there's some very interesting commissions to come. And it's not always op- the obvious superstar artists, but artists of great credibility who may be the next generation or artists who have been rediscovered. That, that's, it's really interesting. So I, I love the idea that art can be embedded into the fabric of a city, not just seen as something that's kind of the equivalent of knickknacks on your on your mantelpiece. But I also love the temporary nature of some public art. I mean, on the underground, things are often installed and then they're taken down after six months. Uh, the model for the for the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, you may know, you may you may have seen some of the projects that have gone on on, to, on the fourth plinth. Really interesting, actually, that instead of just putting a statue up there that people either don't like or stop noticing, it becomes a rotating site. And that idea of a more dynamic approach to art and culture. I mean, you know, bringing it back to design. Design is constantly evolving. When design is fit for purpose. It exists and stays in that state for you know as long as as long as it functions and, and then it evolves. And I like that idea about art in public places. Um, I mean, I think you know we we want some permanent commemorations, but but that shouldn't just be the model. Actually, we should be looking at a more fluid way of engaging with art and artists in public arenas. And it means people can take more risks. They can and they can also experiment. And, and if something doesn't work and it's only up for six months, so be it. And if it does, it'll increase public appetite to have more rather than just keep something that you just become that becomes familiar and, and never seen anymore after a while. Oh, it's really encouraging to hear. So, so go on without pushing you too much. Um, which station should we be looking out for for Art on the Underground? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, have you got have you got a, have you got a favourite? <laughs> no, because that's you can't do that when you've been involved in uh, in, in commissioning. Because then it's like saying which which of your children is your favourite. I, I'm sounding really. I, I shouldn't be too, so coy about it, but it, and but funnily enough, the um, well, the, the, we, the Elizabeth Line. Look at the Elizabeth Line stations. You know the new the new line that will be really interesting. So just watch that space. You know the other thing about the London Underground though I love is when you think of the London Underground and when you use the London Underground. That amazing map by Harry Beck is one of the great pieces of graphic design. So at its heart, and also the graphic identity of the London Underground, that hasn't changed in 60, 70 years, nor should it, because it's beautiful graphic design that is globally recognised. It's a good design is at the core of London Underground, which which is why, you know, art art commissions on on the Underground seems to fit beautifully and why the lack of investment in the infrastructure of the London Underground is is so shocking or sad, at least. Maybe it isn't shocking. Maybe it's inevitable, but it's sad. 2020, you were awarded an OBE in the New Year's Honours list for services to the arts. And congratulations, Tim. It's it's very, very worthy recipient of that. Um, Do you want me to tell you a funny story about that? So, yeah, go for it. so uh, it was great to be awarded it, and um, the plans were to go. It was, I think, because you, you go to the palace to receive it sometime at end of March, beginning of April in uh, in 2020. It was lockdown, so I, I'd been awarded it, but I couldn't actually go and receive it. Like getting your degrees, a lot of your listeners will understand this. It, it's probably more important for your mum 
to go to come with you than anything else. So, so my my wife, my son, and my mother, I was allowed three guests, were, were lined up to, to, to come. And then it got it got postponed. Now my mum's sort of eight, in her early 80s, very sprightly, but oh she you could tell she was very she was very good about it, but you could tell she was gutted. She'd planned this thing. So we did a we did a lockdown, we did an online, uh, we, they all, every, all the three of us, they all got dressed up in their fineries. And I I <laughs> I put a tailcoat on and we sat and had a drink as if we were celebrating on the day that uh, we'd, we'd gone to the palace. Because the point also when you go and get honours is you can have a nice lunch after and celebrate with your family and friends. Anyway, it was the time when we just started on Thursday evenings at, um, at seven o'clock, I think, that people stood on their doorsteps and banged their support for the NHS. So we did. We had this lockdown drink. My mother in one part of the country, us in London, and then so we finished at seven and went out to do the banging of the drums and, and pots and stuff for the NHS and did it. And then the next day, <laughs> I bumped into my neighbour in his garden and my garden saw each other uh, over through the hedge and said, um, "He said I love the way you got so dressed up for the NHS last night, Tim. That was showed real respect." <laughs> I thought, "Blimey, yeah." He, he, anyway, I, I, I sort of I told him eventually that it wasn't quite that. Um, anyway, and then and, and anyway, and then I went to the palace earlier in the summer of last year, and um, this time you were only allowed one guest. So my family nobly made the sacrifice. They just met us for lunch afterwards. They cut to the chase, and my mum, bless her, came to the palace and spent a lot of time on a one to one, being able to talk with Prince Charles, who gave me who gave me the OBE. So it was a it was a joyful thing as much as a, a, a being a family celebration than it, than it was a, a, a an honour. Amazing. You can pick one part of your career that sort of really stands out. What what, what would it be? To- I've enjoyed the portfolio nature of a career. You know, I, I mean, I, I worked at the Tate uh, in the early years. I've I had a career as a radio broadcaster and then television, um, at BBC and then other media. I've enjoyed all of that. I've loved my time at White Cube and, you know, setting up galleries in different parts of London, but also Hong Kong and Sao Paulo. Uh, so the kind of cumulative effect of all of that and the opportunities they've all afforded and being able to do, you know, different parts of, of um of my career being able to overlap I think it's been really important rather than always just being mono focused but I think I probably have to say that the the six years I spent at the Royal Academy working closely with artists in an organization I'm incredibly fond of but it is basket case in some ways I mean you've never set up an institution like that now but it, it but it works and those amazing galleries and the opportunities of putting on the kinds of shows we did you know with Ai Weiwei or Anthony Gormley looking at the art of Oceania and um I mean, there were so many opportunities. To, like I always described it as the, you know, the greatest cultural playground in London and maybe beyond. And so that was that was wonderful. But actually, I, I mean, like artists, it's the only parallel I would make between me and artists. You, you, you get much more excited by what you're doing and what you're about to do. That's the nature of, of uh, I think, of working uh, in museums. So I'm incredibly excited about, you know, I, hopefully that what I'm doing now becomes the most important or enjoyable part of my career. Although um, there are certain constraints put on <laughs> put on me at the moment here, in, 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 uh, given the situation we're in. But, I, you know, I, I love that opportunity. And I think, you know, you have to, um, you, you, I think... One of the things I've enjoyed at every part of the career I've had is the closeness to creative people. You know, sometimes interviewing artists, sometimes programming uh, exhibitions with them, working alongside them in a commercial gallery. And that's one of the things I really want to do here is at the Design Museum, is to be able to work closely with designers and architects and artists and look at those you know, where boundaries are blurred. I, I, you know, I like the company of creative people, not being a particularly creative person myself. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to having having you over here in Singapore. Like I said, um, I've got so many more questions I want to ask you, but I want to, want to give that opportunity to the members when we when we can see you. But there is there is one question that we ask everybody on this channel, which is, if we could give you the British Chamber of Commerce's time machine, and you can take yourself back to a certain point in your career where you could, with all the information that you know now, you could give yourself some advice at a, at a younger age. What advice would you give give yourself, and and when would you go back and tell it to yourself? It's a really interesting question. Um, but it's that notion of trying not to have regrets. If you think too, if you think too in too linear a way along the lines that you're inviting me to think about, you, you're not using or harnessing or building on that which exists. This is I'm being evasive, aren't I? In other words, I try not to think in those terms. I try always to think, well, here this is where we are and where I am. This is this is what I've done so far. These are the opportunities, these are the problems. How are we going to get through it? Um, anyway, um, I, I tell you what I do. Uh, 
I've never expressed this as a regret publicly anywhere before. And it was very difficult at the time to do it because I, uh, so I was doing a PhD, but I got the opportunity to start broadcasting, lecturing, and then uh, uh, the employment opportunities in, in the early nineties. And I don't, I know at the time I made the right decision that I had to stop doing my PhD and get on with those things. And I think that was the, the right choice. I just wish I'd been a bit more, I wish I'd been really intensive. The advice would have been do more of the backbone work on that PhD, get it to a point where you really could finish it rather than giving giving up on it, knowing that actually there was still too much to do. I'd quite like to have got that PhD. I'd quite like to have got that, that postgraduate. Well, I mean, I'd like to finish that. Um, and because I think the joy of research and actually having time to, to research is it feels like increasingly a luxury in my life. But maybe in the future, if I can find a way of doing this, maybe you know, the, the next chapter of my life in a few years time after we, you know, we've got the design museum up and running, um, sorry, the future observatory up and running in the design museum into its next chapter, because I don't believe that the directors should stay endlessly at institutions. Maybe I can pick up on the research then. But I, I, I yeah, I, I, I would, my advice to myself would be don't neglect the opportunities and make opportunities to, to research. It's, it's a brilliant thing. And of course, I've, I've had to research many things. If, if you're a broadcaster, you, you know, you know this, you, you have to quickly assimilate uh, in order to, be able to in, do the interviews or do the programmes or do the presentations you've got to do. But I'm talking about deep research. You know, I, 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 I would want to go uh, remind myself of the importance of actually going deep into a subject. Oh, super. Thank you so much for spending your time talking to us. Like I said, we are really looking forward to having you over here. And it's been great to hear about the Design Museum, some of the amazing programmes coming up. They're incredibly well aligned to what we're, what we're, what we're all about at the Chamber as well. I think, um, I think your stewardship over the last couple of years um, in, in, in difficult times has, has absolutely come through. So thanks so, so much for being with us today. Thanks very much, David. I'm looking forward to, to meeting you and, and, and seeing everyone in Singapore. Great stuff. Thanks, Tim. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the British Chambers podcast. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe and why not leave us a rating and review on Spotify, Apple, Google and the other podcast platforms. For more information, please visit our website at www.britcham.org.sg and tune in next time for a brand new episode.